Please be seated. The Beatitudes are a familiar passage to us where our Lord says, Blessed are the poor, those who mourn, the meek, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, the merciful, the pure in heart, the peacemakers, those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. In the Beatitudes, the main part of them, anyway, he talks about others. Blessed are those who are poor. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who are meek. But in the final concluding part, Jesus says to his disciples, blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. And this week, uh, Wednesday of this week, we celebrated the feast of the conversion of St. Paul. The week before that was the confession of St. Peter, in which St. Peter says to Jesus, you are the Messiah, the Son of God. And Jesus says to Peter, you are the rock on which I will build my church. And of course, you know we are in the season of Epiphany, although the color has changed to green. And uh, last week, well, for the previous two weeks, I have simply forgotten, I've gotten busy and forgotten to bring out my green vestments. And so I had continued to wear the white of Epiphany, the early part of the Epiphany season. And uh, a friend of mine from Michigan uh, sent me a message last Sunday, who is also a priest and also, also a, I think, works on Sundays. Uh, he said, <laughs> Why were you wearing white? I thought, that's odd. Uh, I said, well, it was actually because I just forgot to get the green out, and the white was right there, and the mass was starting, so I had to put something on. Um, but anyway, here's the, here's the green. But, uh, but we are still in the season of Epiphany, and so we have this sense of manifestation. And the story of St. Paul's conversion is a dramatic one. We know how it happened, how he was on the road to Damascus, and there was a blinding light. He lost his sight temporarily and heard the voice of God, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Now, it's important though to rewind from that great moment of epiphany for Saul, later Paul, <coughs> and think about just who he was. He was part of the religious establishment, part of the elite, and we read on that Wednesday from the book of Acts, his testimony before King Agrippa. And it's, it, it was a passage I hadn't read in a while and really was very painterly in describing his great antipathy towards the followers of Jesus. He persecuted them with all of his heart and soul, his whole life at that point was dedicated to persecuting Christians. He followed them, he said, even into foreign cities to track them down and to turn them in before the temple police. He was doing everything he could to stamp out this light of Christ. He was, to be honest, doing his job. And he did it with all of his heart. And everything he had, he poured into this. But we know that the will of God and the light of Christ are things that cannot be trifled with or put out by human doing. And so Paul receives this message from God, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he asks, who are you? And the voice says, I am Jesus Christ, whom you persecute. And the funny thing is that Jesus doesn't then go on to berate Saul and tell him what a horrible person he is and how uh, he's uh, sort of hindering, obstructing God's will for the world 
and how he should be punished, how he should grovel or ask for forgiveness. But he simply introduces himself. I am Jesus, whom you persecute. And now, Saul, I have a job for you. It's amazing, isn't it? One moment, Saul is actively persecuting people, possibly causing them death. And in just a moment, God takes this person who is doing great harm to others and turns his heart and makes him into one of his greatest apostles. So he was on the road to Damascus. He was headed there to a foreign city to track down some Christians and to give them the what for. But Jesus says, keep going. Keep going to Damascus. And when you get there, tell them the wonders that I have done. And so we know that St. Paul does get to Damascus. The scales fall from his eyes. He regains his sight. And from that time forward, he becomes St. Paul, one of the greatest leaders of our church. Uh, certainly in the Eastern Christian Church, he is greatly revered. Of course, he's greatly revered in the West as well, but uh, very, uh, they have a, a great connection to him in the way that the Western Church has a connection to St. Peter. But every, practically every Sunday, practically every time we gather and celebrate the Holy Eucharist, we hear from this person. Isn't that amazing? This person who would have destroyed Christianity if he had his way is someone whose words we listen to constantly. We may not be cognizant of it all the time, but his words are part of our, the fabric of who we are as Christians. Sometimes his letters are described as love letters to the church. Well, there's not... The theme is not always love <laughs> in these letters. Sometimes he has to set things right. Because, uh, you know, in an era before any kind of mass communication, imagine how these letters had to be written. Well, first of all, he had to get word of whatever was going on in whatever place. He had to get his thoughts together, write it down, and somehow send it and get it to where it's supposed to go. Um, you know how people are. They uh, develop their own little... <laughs> habits and ways, and, and as the church was growing and growing and growing, people were getting a little off track here and there, and so he had to try to rein that all in. But usually they are love letters. He says how blessed he is to know certain people, how he knows what, what great faith they have. And, uh, but here, he's speaking to the Corinthians in the passage that we have this week. And he says, consider your own call, brothers and sisters. And this is written to the church in Corinth. But I think we can read this and listen to this letter as if it was written to St. Mary's. A letter to, from Paul to St. Mary's. Consider your own call, brothers and sisters. Not many of you were wise by human standards. standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth, but God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to reduce to nothing things that are, so that no one might boast in the presence of God. He is the source of your life in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom of God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption in order that, as it is written, let one, the one who boasts, boast of the Lord. So it is that, like the people of, who are contemporaries of St. Paul, we who are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years later, certainly not his contemporaries, but spiritual contemporaries, I suppose you could say, also share this calling as Christians. We find ourselves 
called by God to do various things. I still sometimes really can't believe that I'm a priest. Um, one of my friends from New Orleans who moved to New York uh, shortly before I did, um, I, I ran into him after I was in New York and uh, he was uh, singing somewhere and uh, I told him what I was up to and he of course knew me back in New Orleans and he said, wow, Jesus really does save. <laughs> So there you go. Um, so you have to sort of uh, open your heart, I think, and be and let your ego go. Because if you think too much of, of your, your own ego or your own failings, I think uh, for priests and others, it's, it's very easy to fall into the trap of imposter syndrome. But, uh, but what, what we hear and what we see and what we know from St. Paul is, look at him. He's the greatest example of, of this, of, of all. He wasn't with Jesus the whole time. He wasn't one of the original 12 who followed him faithfully. He wasn't St. John who stood by his side at the cross as he was crucified. No, he was condemning Jesus and his followers and doing everything he can to put out that light. And yet, in his sinfulness, God chose him and he became one of the greatest of the apostles. And so, my brothers and sisters, we have it all in our hearts, as flawed and as failing as we can be sometimes, to be the, the word of God, to be the body of Christ, to be his disciples here and now. I know I've said this before, but it bears saying again that we are called in our time to show forth this light, this light that cannot be put out, even though we see darkness all around us, even though we are surrounded by war and pestilence, famine in places, we know that the message of Jesus Christ is foolishness, as Paul said, to the world. Because what, is, what does Jesus tell us? Who is, who is blessed? The strong, the powerful, the violent, those who seek after power and status? No. Who is blessed? The poor in spirit, those who mourn, the meek, those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, the merciful, the pure in heart, the peacemakers, those who are persecuted. Jesus' kingdom is the polar opposite of the kingdom of the world. It is the world turned upside down. And this is what Paul preached and taught to the early church, what he preaches and teaches to us today, and is the world that we are called in our way and in our time to create. May there be peace in our time. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, be in our hearts, but also on our, in our mouths and in our actions and in our hearts and everything that we do. And as St. Paul diligently wrote and traveled and did everything in his power to bring forth the kingdom of God, may we do that in our own time as well. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.